Look forward to that continuing on this year. Um, I think homelessness and housing is something, the housing crisis is something that affects all of our communities. And I really look forward to us um, having bipartisan conversations on the solutions that, ca that can help uh, solve the crisis. So uh, thank you for that. Just a couple of housekeeping things. Um, I think most of you have probably had committees in here before now, um, but the on and off switches for your microphones are right in front of you. They are pretty sensitive, so if you're not speaking at the moment, if you please turn them off, that would be great. Um, really, when I think about the housing crisis facing Minnesota, it is something that touches every corner of our state, and we have a real opportunity here this session with the budget surplus and with leaders who have expressed a real commitment to this topic. Um, so I am hopeful that we will bring fresh ideas. I don't think we need to be sort of put in a box of what the solutions might be. And the more that we can center those solutions in the communities, in the people who have lived, lived experiences, the more effective we'll be at actually solving them. So I really look forward to working with you all on that. Um, I will uh, start here with Laura and Dan um, to give us sort of an overview on the jurisdiction and the financial overview of this committee. So if you guys would introduce yourselves and uh, go over the jurisdictions, please. Okay, my name is Laura, Mr. Chair, Ms. Madam Chair and members. Um, my name is Laura Painter. I'm the legislative analyst for the committee. So um, I can help draft bills, I can do research, and um, if you need any amendments, feel free to contact me. Um, the jurisdiction for the committee, um, the Committee on Housing and Homelessness Prevention has jurisdiction over all bills relating to housing and homelessness prevention. So we'll hear bills related to homeless shelters, manufactured housing, rent control, transitional housing, and any other bills related to housing. Um, we have jurisdiction over the, the Housing Finance Agency and we confirm the Commissioner of Housing Finance and the members of the Housing Finance Agency. Um, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Painter. Mr. Mueller? Um, thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Dan Mueller. I'm the fiscal analyst for uh, this committee. I was the fiscal analyst on this committee the, uh, previously under Senator Dreheim. Um, the, I'm not going to go into great detail on the budget. The Housing Finance Agency will um, go program, at, program by program explaining their budget, but just sort of a framework um, for this committee's jurisdiction. It does, again, fund the Housing Finance Agency. In the current biennium, the total amount is $125.6 million for the current biennium, and then going for the next biennium, the base budget is $115.6 million. So there's about $10 million of one-time funding in the current biennium. The other thing I'll note is that this committee will have jurisdiction over housing infrastructure bonds and the authorization for those, and we'll have to cover the new debt service for housing infrastructure bonds will be part of this committee's uh, purview. So that's all I have for now. Thank you, Mr. Mueller. Uh, we'll now go on to introductions of the members and staff on this committee. I'll start here to my right with my staff, and we'll just go along the table and then go to the left. Hi, everyone. I'm Davin Sokup. I'll be the CA for the committee this session. Good afternoon. I'm Courtney Schaff, committee legislative assistant to Lindsay Port. Hello, everyone. Jack Dudley, uh, legislative assistant to Senator Liz Bolden, who's the vice chair. Thank you. And then, Liz, do you want to start us um, talking about introduce yourself, your district, and uh, what's important to you in housing? Yeah. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Good afternoon. I'm Senator Liz Bolden. I represent District 25, which is much of Rochester, uh, Ornoco, and surrounding areas. I am very excited to serve on this committee. Housing is a basic human right for all, for everyone, um, something that all Minnesotans should have, regardless of race or place or income. Um, really the most fundamental need that there is, is a safe place to lay your head at night and a, and a safe home. And so I am really excited to, to do the work to be sure that that is a reality for all Minnesotans. Thank you, Senator Bolden. Senator Lucero. 
Thank you, Madam Chair, and I uh, equally am excited of this committee and being a member. I've never been a member of the Housing Committee in the House. Uh, for those who don't know who I am, uh, Senator Lucero, I was a House member for the last eight years, so I'm new to this body and new to the committee, but I'm not new to housing. Uh, my wife and I are both real estate agents. We have a brokerage. We have a property management company. Uh, I'm a, uh, also a licensed general contractor. And so uh, very familiar with the challenges. Now the district I represent is for the most part, it straddles inside the count, seven county and then most of it's outside the seven county metro area. And it includes Rockford Township, Hanover, St. Michael, Albertville, Otsego, Elk River, now then, and Western Oak Grove. So it's a combination of uh, cornfields in the township to one of the fastest growing communities uh, in the state, both St. Michael and Otsego are just exploding with housing. And, and then it spans the spectrum in terms of the number of houses, uh, not number, the age of the houses, in terms of construction material, energy efficiency, uh, the, the styles, the mandates, how, how <laughs> amount of elbow space they have. And so uh, I very much appreciate your sentiment of, of bipartisanship because uh, pathways to home ownership are incredibly important. It's not a, a partisan topic. And one of the things I also do, my, my primary profession is cybersecurity. So I've been a technologist for about 10, uh, 20 years now. And the things that we do in the technology field is we, whenever there's an issue, whenever you can't get on the internet, whatever the technology issue might be, we seek to find root cause analysis. And if we can find root cause analysis, we can then remediate the situation. That's what I'd like to do in the, the housing crisis here in Minnesota is what is the root cause analysis? How can we address that? So thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Senator Lucero. Senator Rust. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Ann Rest. I represent District 43, which is uh, Crystal, Golden Valley, New Hope, Robbinsdale, and a little bit of Plymouth. Um, I've served on the Housing Committee for the last four years, have learned a lot, and intend to learn a whole lot more. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Rest. Senator Drayheim. Thank you, uh, Chair Port, uh, and thank you for the kind words. Um, you know, I, I think everybody here kind of knows where my passion is for, for, for housing and how important it is in everybody's lives. Um, so thank you for expanding the committee, which I tried to do, and you got it done, so good for you. Um, look forward to adding and learning about that homelessness portion that we talked about but really didn't do anything on the last two years. Um, you know, I, I think understanding that portion of our committee is going to be really important. Um, and, and see where we're failing um, as a state to get people on that pathway, as Le uh, Senator Lucero said, to home ownership. Uh, for those who don't know, I'm Rich Dreheim. I have uh, District 22 now, which is commonly referred to as a leftover district. It uh, encompasses um, about seven counties. Um, there's 68 townships, 34 cities, 20 school districts, and then parts of two congressional districts. Uh, it runs um, northwest to Jordan, all the way down to Iowa. Um, but a good district, uh, I, I'm learning it. Uh, it. It's very rural, very small town. Um, Fairmont is my biggest city uh, in the southern part of my district. and. Um, a lot of needs for housing. So I look forward to our conversations. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Dreheim. Senator Pa. Thank you, Chair Port. Um, I'm Senator Susan Pa that represents uh, Senate District 38. Uh, that's Brooklyn Park, Brooklyn Center, and Osseo. I'm incredibly grateful to be able to serve on this committee. Uh, I really truly believe that a stable home is essential and fundamental to people's ability to thrive. And so that's something that's super important to me. And I think we're going to do a lot of great work on this committee. I look forward to that. Thank you, Senator Pa. Senator Mohammed. Hi, everyone. I'm Zayda Mohammed. I represent South Minneapolis Senate District 63, which is around uh, Lake Nokomis, Minnehaha Falls, um, and our Seward neighborhood, if you've ever been around there. And 
and I am very excited to be a part of this committee. I am a renter, and so um, I have a number of things that I'd love for us to discuss around that issue. Pathways to home ownership is going to be really important for me, and we have a serious uh, crisis around homelessness, so hopefully we'll be able to tackle some of those issues. Thank you, Senator Mohammed. Uh, I, I just, I suppose I should introduce myself as well. I'm Senator Lindsay Port. I represent District 55, which is Burnsville and Savage in the South Metro. I am delighted to chair this committee. I think we have uh, so much work to do around housing and homelessness prevention. And while sometimes we call this work bipartisan, I also think it's sort of nonpartisan um, in that it affects all of our communities and there really is an opportunity for us to work together um, to, to create pathways to home ownership, to solve the homelessness crisis, um, and I look forward to doing that with all of you. I will uh, say that as a whole, um, over the next few weeks, we will be doing a lot of informational sort of sharing. Um, we'll have the commissioner and the agency here today, and we'll also have them back again next week. Um, we will be hearing from some advocates on Thursday uh, who deal in sort of the spectrum of housing so that we can start to build a picture. Um, and, uh, you know, as Senator Drahan alluded to, we didn't get to do work on homelessness prevention much last cycle. Um, and so we'll be spending some time also really digging in to understand where homelessness is across the state. Um, so we'll be doing some informational meetings on that as well. But I do encourage you all to get in your bills uh, so that we can start scheduling hearings for them uh, as we start moving through the process. But for today, I would like to invite Commissioner Jennifer Ho um, and her colleagues from the agency up to present an overview for the Minnesota Housing Finance Agency. And if you could just introduce yourselves for the record, please. Chair Port and members of the committee. Oh, good. I was trying to remember if I had a button. I don't. Uh, Chair Port and members of the committee, my name is Jennifer Ho. I'm the Commissioner of Minnesota Housing. Uh, I, I hope to uh, have the opportunity to work with you for the next four years. Um, I look forward to the conversation uh, around that. Before I jump into the agency, Chair Port asked me to just uh, tell you a little bit about, uh, about who I am and why, I guess, uh, I'm the commissioner at Minnesota Housing. But first, I'm here with Dan Kitzberger. He's my legislative director. I, um, uh, for folks uh, that are newer in your roles, the agency can also serve just as a technical resource uh, for you as well. Uh, in terms of talking through bill language or thinking about uh, just different policy issues or if there's general environmental things in the housing ecosphere that you're interested in. Uh, so I encourage uh, all of you to reach out to me or to Dan um, if you have questions along the way. We're also joined by our colleague Amanda Welliver. Amanda is new to the policy team this session, uh, but she worked very closely uh, uh, on our, our COVID relief programs prior to that. So. Uh, so you'll get to know both uh, Amanda, Dan, and myself. I am, um, uh, first of all, let me say uh, the opportunity to serve a second term is something that I'm extraordinarily ex excited about and, and grateful for, uh, if it be the pleasure of the Senate. I um, was talking to some of the other commissioners, uh, I think there were nine of us that started at the beginning of the first term uh, that that's signed up for the second term. And the thing that's exciting about a second term is that you actually know what your job is. I, um, we were all very, very excited four years ago, but, but there was that uncertainty of, of what is it that we do. I, um, when I first took the job, part of my trepidation is that I'm not a housing finance person. I, um, I now have four years of housing finance under my belt, so I don't think I can, I can say that, nor should I say that. I've learned a great deal over the course of the last four years. But the reason that I believe that I was asked to be the housing commissioner in the first place is that since 1999, I had devoted my career to preventing and ending homelessness. And in doing that work, I worked for 11 years with the Minnesota legislature, um, helping uh, folks largely in the health and human services uh, committee understand that investments in support of housing, where we pair housing and services together, is what's needed to help people, especially people with severe mental illness, addiction, other chronic health conditions, get off the street and into stable homes. 
I, um, and in fact that it was cost effective to do so. So I had 11 years of, uh, of getting two minutes at a time uh, up at the tables to talk about that work, uh, but with great success uh, over that period of time. I, um, I had actually come to the work of ending homelessness from 10 years in managed care. Um, so I, I felt like I understood healthcare financing, uh, but, but now to, to housing financing. But the, the tie between managed care and homelessness was really understanding that as somebody who ran a managed care Medicaid program, I probably had members who were experiencing homelessness, that my case management tools were not designed to case manage. And yet these were probably members who were the frequent users of the emergency room, people who had extended hospitalizations, people who were, um, from managed care speak, um, high utilizers, uh, high cost members, but we weren't getting good health outcomes for them. So the work on homelessness was really around demonstrating that when somebody had a stable home, you actually could get not only a good housing outcome, but you could get a good health outcome, you could get a good life outcome, and you could actually have a much wiser use of public expenditure uh, in terms of uh, what the money was purchasing in terms of quality of life and the use of services. In my work on homelessness, I got exposed to the national policy conversation uh, that ultimately created an opportunity for me to go into federal service for seven years, three at the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness, where I helped write the first ever federal plan to prevent and end homelessness, and to work across federal agencies on policy and with communities in terms of how do we use data-driven best practices in order to accomplish results for all people experiencing homelessness with targeted work on veterans people experiencing chronic homelessness, youth, and families. Um, I'm pleased to see that the progress on reducing veterans' homelessness continues. In fact, the VA just announced another 11% decrease in veterans' homelessness, which means that the number of veterans experiencing homelessness on any given night in America has been reduced by over half. That doesn't just happen. That happens when strategic investments have, get sustained around best practices that are implemented faithfully across communities. So one of the things that I'm excited about is to work with you so that we can invest in strategies that help reduce and ultimately end homelessness by doing it in a very data-driven, evidence-based way that also <coughs> captures the voices and experiences and preferences of the people who have experienced homelessness themselves. So I bring that work on ending homelessness here I also spent four years in the HUD Secretary's office where I continued to work on homelessness but worked on aging and disability and kids' issues um, for two HUD secretaries. So when I came into this work, it was the opportunity to kind of translate everything I learned working at a federal level into state government, everything that I learned working at a nonprofit level into state government, and really was an opportunity for me to attend to the whole continuum of housing, everything from how do we prevent and end homelessness, which I felt like I was pretty good on, uh, but really understanding the rental market and how what isn't working in the rental market actually causes homelessness. Uh, what do we need to do to have a healthy rental market? I was lucky to come in right after the previous administration had actually done a very deep dive on what the, the shortages were in our housing market and what was driving the challenges that people were having. So I kind of inherited the data on, on the shortages and what had led to them and what we needed to do to, to reverse those. And I feel like um, the work that we do in the rental space um, is really focused on making sure that the rental market works for folks who make the least. Housing is a private market function in the United States with a little bit of a public assist from the federal government and from states. And so where government steps in, whether through the low income housing tax credit or uh, HUD programs, or what we do together, our job is to really attend to folks where the private market um, isn't meeting their needs, folks at 50% of area median income or below, for example. So the rental market is a big piece of it, both from a production and preservation point, but also where we set rents and, and, and how we preserve these assets, how we preserve the federal dollars that come in. And of course, the, the third part of this is homeownership. Uh, I am a homeowner. Um, I, I live, I should say, in St. Paul, in St. Anthony Park, but obviously serve the whole state here. Um, as I was looking at my ice dams on the way out, uh, really appreciating uh, all the joys of home ownership. 
But the agency has done critical work uh, around uh, working with organizations who can do first-time homebuyer counseling, helping people get ready for home ownership. Um, we do an extraordinary amount of work at the agency with down payment and closing cost assistance. Um, uh, as I heard a, a federal colleague say recently, some folks don't have the bank of mom and dad to help them make that first purchase into a home. Uh, that's a role that we can play with down payment assistance. Very critical in helping people who don't have uh, a large savings account or a big multi-generational asset to, to cash in on in order to get their first home. We also have uh, rehab programs, um, uh, help especially in places with aging housing stock, and that's really critical to what we do. And of course, if you're trying to buy a home uh, today, either for the first time or to downsize, we just don't have enough supply. We don't have enough supply in the market, we don't have enough supply in the market for folks that make the lease. So it's great to be the housing commissioner. Uh, you get to work on everything from preventing and ending homelessness through the rental market into home ownership, how to keep uh, uh, the, the homes that we have uh, usable, safe, uh, energy efficient uh, for families that have them. And I'll say the other thing that's been spectacular over the last four years with some hiccups around, uh, around the pandemic was, is being able to travel and being able to uh, travel to parts of the state that I had never been in before. Um, and to really appreciate that there's really not a community that I have visited where there wasn't a need for at least some part of the portfolio of what Minnesota housing does. In some places, it's a, a smaller community with a thriving industry, and in order to get workers, they need to have rental housing because nobody's gonna buy a home the first day they take a job. They wanna find out if they like the job and if they're gonna stay. Um, in other communities, it's an aging housing stock. And how is it that we do rehab so that we can keep seniors in their homes? In other places, they want to build senior housing. Um, people want simplified living as they age. We do senior housing. In some communities, they're dealing with large numbers of people living outside. They need permanent supportive housing. In many communities, it's kind of all of the above. So I really do believe that it doesn't matter where you live in the state, which community you represent, that there are things that Minnesota Housing does uh, that we do in partnership together that can make Minnesota a great place to live, a great place to work, a great place to age, a great place to raise kids. Um, but um, uh, reiterating what many of you said, the housing is very fundamental. If we don't get housing right, it's hard to get anything else right. So I, um, uh, there's a lot of uh, wonky uh, things about the agency operation. Uh, we have the authority to issue bonds. It's how we... Uh, uh, raise funds to support the rental market and single family home ownership. Um, we do things with the low income housing tax credit, but most importantly what we do with the appropriations and the bonding authority that you give us is that it allows us to, uh, to address what communities say that they need in order to meet uh, the housing needs of their residents. So I don't know, that was kind of a blur between an introduction of me and and the work, but you know, what do you do for fun? I run the Minnesota Housing Finance Agency. That's just kind of the way that it goes. So um, I do look forward to getting to know those of you uh, that I haven't spent much time with. I do understand that you play an important role in my tenure. Um, and so uh, I think uh, Chair Port uh, will set aside special time just to make sure that you understand uh, me and, and my role in running the, the agency. But I'll pivot to the slides if that makes sense to you, Chair Port. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner. I will just say um, we will be taking up the Commissioner's confirmation as soon as we get a packet uh, that allows us to do that. Um, so I do encourage you, I know she's been reaching out to all of you to, to take time to meet with the Commissioner as soon as possible um, so that you can get to know uh, Commissioner Ho a little bit before we take up her uh, confirmation in this um, in this hearing. But um, I also want to say to the Commissioner's point of you know, housing looks different all across the state uh, and that she has spent significant time touring the state. Um, we will also be uh, creating some opportunities for this committee to go across the state of Minnesota and sort of tour and see the housing needs. Um, so if there are particular things of interest in your own communities um, or districts or areas of the state that you would like included in that, please reach out to myself or Davin um, to let us know, but we'll start creating those opportunities both throughout session but into the summer as well for us to sort of get a full glimpse of the housing continuum across our state. Commissioner, go ahead with your slides. Thank you, Chairport. Um, and also, uh, we have staff that are working on uh, your district lines 
and we'll be able to highlight for you places where uh, Minnesota Housing has made investments um, in your district uh, and highlight some of those uh, key either new construction, preservation, or other types of, of programs so that you have can make the connection between uh, your constituents and, and what we do. So why we exist, um, as I said, uh, housing impacts everything everywhere and uh, all parts of our lives. And so uh, our, our job is to, is to be the way that the state helps support making housing work. Uh, we're a little bit different than other state departments. Um, we don't run a whole state housing system. Um, uh, as I said, it's a, it's a private market system by and large, but we are the, the state public assist. Uh, we were created in 1971 um, through Congress uh, when states were given uh, the authority to create housing finance agencies in order to issue bonds uh, in order to help support both home ownership and the rental market. I, um, I am governed uh, by a seven-member board, uh, also something that makes me somewhat unique as a, uh, as a state agency. That board is, includes the state auditor as well as uh, six other members. We uh, have independent financial audits, and we also work with the rating agencies, Moody's, Standard & Poor's, because we're active in the bond market. So we have a lot of uh, independent oversight I'd say, um, in terms of our structure. Uh, we're also unique uh, because we're a lending, lending institution, uh, shorthand, we're the state's housing bank. Uh, we're a lending institution. Uh, we actually uh, can earn money on uh, loans when they get, pay us back. And um, therefore, we're able to self-fund the agency's operations. So we don't come to you uh, to ask to, uh, for the office and the technology systems and the staff that run the programs. And uh, if you take a look at uh, the Minnesota housing overall financial piece, the state appropriations are about 4% of my overall budget. That's fluctuated a little over the last few years because of the huge infusion of COVID relief programs that came through the agency. I, um, but I would say that that 4% of the agency program budget is also what distinguishes us across housing finance agencies across the country. Not every housing finance agency has a partnership with their state legislature that includes adding state appropriated dollars into what they do. Many do, but not all do. And I think that it's the work that we do together that allows us to be so active, for example, on the work of preventing and ending homelessness on the work uh, for very low income renters and things like that. And so that will be more apparent as we talk about the specific tools, uh, the specific line items that we have. I, um, we've got a great bond rating from both Moody's and Standard & Poor's. I, um, uh, it's easy for me to say we're the best state housing finance agency in the country, but in fact we are. And uh, if you talk to the raters, if you talk to the national national financial advisors who work across state agencies, if you take a look at just the volume of issuance that we do for our size, if you take a look at the work that we're doing on home ownership, uh, we, we've won national awards and a lot of the work, and that has nothing to do with me. I inherited a great agency. And, um, and we have a, a structure um, in terms of our finances that just makes us head and shoulders uh, stronger than some of our, our peers around the country. I am... Um, uh, Go to the next slide. Um, so, you know, we are a financial agency. We're Minnesota Housing Finance Agency. Um, so we really do everything that we do through others. Um, we work with uh, lenders, mortgage lenders. We work with developers. We work with service providers across the state. That's our delivery mechanism to the, the services on behalf of Minnesotans. So you don't come to my office to get a, a home mortgage. You go to a network of our lenders uh, to get a mortgage. We're the financial institution that's behind that. I, um, uh, we help developers put together the complex funding that allows them to do new construction or a preservation project. Uh, we've got a couple hard hats in the office, but we, uh, we, don't, build, uh, we don't build anything ourselves. And we're reliant on uh, a statewide network of service providers for the work that we do on, on homelessness prevention on the home, home buyer counseling and other things like that. Next slide. So just in more detail, what do we do? In home ownership, 
We finance mortgages, down payment and closing cost assistance, home improvements, rehab loans, counseling education and training for homeowners. Uh, we have a very intensive uh, a model for people who will sometimes take a year or two to build credit or repair credit and really understand that it's not just buying a home but what you need to do to maintain the home uh, after you get in there uh, and we also uh, finance the creation of more uh, affordable single-family or I would say probably increasingly single-family duplex triplex uh, types of homes on the rental side we finance both the creation and preservation of rental housing, uh, really targeting housing that's affordable uh, to folks that can't uh, afford the private market units. We do rental assistance and operating subsidies. We do homelessness prevention and assistance. And we administer for HUD a large network of uh, project-based Section 8 properties across the state. So we're the, the project-based contract administrator for HUD. And then as the pandemic has, has required, uh, we have been the temporary administrator of the COVID-19 housing assistance funds. Um, you may have heard of the COVID-19 housing assistance program or Rent Help MN. Uh, we are currently operating Home Help MN for uh, homeowners who are behind. So if, uh, if you know a homeowner who's behind on their mortgage or other housing related expenses, just a little a plug for homehelpmn.org. I am. Um, I think our other role is just to understand what's happening in the housing space across the state. So to really understand uh, what's happening in the home buying market, what's happening in a very volatile interest rate environment. Um, I am uh, old enough that I remember high interest rates, uh, but I am young enough that I've never uh, managed programs through a high interest rate, rising interest rate environment. I, um, so just really kind of understanding the impacts of that, understanding the impacts on uh, the, the rental market, on supply, uh, understanding policy issues uh, as it relates to housing, and of course the, the policy issues, uh, or Senator Lucero said, that, you know, what are the, the primary causes, what's, what's creating homelessness, what's creating challenges in the rental market. So uh, we do have a, a great team of folks with kind of deep expertise. We do research, we do data gathering. Uh, to really understand the housing market as a whole. And then just uh, to sum again, a uh, list of things that we don't do. Um, uh, but uh, lucky for us, we have a ton of strong partners in Minnesota. I think it's another thing that makes Minnesota housing great is that we have so many great both for-profit and non-profit players in the housing space here. So I'll take a moment and just talk about the need. Um, the housing needs are everywhere in the state. As this map illustrates, there might be worse in some places than others, but there's um, households that are cost burdened, which means that they pay more than they can afford on their housing, whether that's rental or home ownership. So one in four households are paying 30% or more of their income on ha their housing costs. 30% has been a long time standard that the federal government has established. So this is just a, a look at it so that you can kind of see yourself in the geography of the way that that um, spreads across the state. But I mean, no, even notably, if you take a look at the, the, the purplish, darkish areas where the most people are, are cost burdened, that doesn't, um, it, it's not just a metro thing. It's not just a, a northern Minnesota thing. We, we see instances of that all over the state. I mean, what we know is that when the housing crash happened, um, that there was a, really a dramatic slowdown in the production of more housing. And so you had a number of things happening in the housing space that ultimately led to a severe shortage of units of housing so that we actually had more households than we had units of housing. It's a basic supply demand thing. Um, with a high demand, low supply, prices went up. And so, you know, the goal is to try to, you know, catch up on production and specifically catch up on production where the private market wouldn't. Our current market conditions um, are rough uh, for folks doing the work out there, and we see, we see this deal by deal um, that we're working on in the agency. Construction costs are high and they're volatile. 
the you know the price of lumber uh, you know spiked supply chain issues around you know you're going to open a new apartment building the last thing you're waiting for is the washer dryer I, um, so that costs are high and volatile. Uh, there are also uh, labor issues. I've got developers who can get a bid on something that they want to build, but the bid only lasts for a limited period of time. And we're trying to you know, move all the complexities of an affordable housing financing deal uh, in time for somebody to be able to keep that bid and the numbers not to move again. Interest rates are the highest they've been in a decade and are still going up. Uh, by every indication that we hear from the Fed. And if you take a look at the shortage, the shortage impacts um, housing that costs the least, uh, whether that's a uh, single family home supply or whether that's the rental market, the shortage is the greatest uh, in places that we call deeply affordable. So what that means is that we have almost 600,000 households paying 30% or more of their income on rent. Um, we've got uh, extremely low income renters, the vast majority of whom are paying more than they can afford on rent. We've got 184,000 uh, people in kind of the age when people tend to be first time home buyers who have the income to be able to afford a mortgage, uh, but they're still renting. And for some, I mean, that may very well be a, a lifestyle choice and a, a, you know, a, a decision. But for folks who are trying to get into home ownership, we got a lot of folks who can afford it, but we need to help them both with that uh, down payment and closing cost as well as the supply. Limited supply of homes that are for sale for $250,000 or less. Many of you mentioned your realtors. You know that probably better even than I. And uh, the kind of the, probably the, the place where our housing crisis shows the most, we have 8,000 people that are experiencing homelessness on any given night in Minnesota. We see racial disparities in every single part of the housing continuum. There's nearly a 50 point gap in home ownership rates between black and white Minnesota households. I, um, and, uh, you know, I mean, that, that persists. So that is definitely something and, and uh, Senator Dreheim, uh, we, we, we worked a lot on that issue, uh, talked a lot about that issue over the course of, of the last couple of years, but that is a, a problem that would be great for us to solve together. Um, at the other end of the housing continuum, we see extraordinary disparities in who experiences homelessness. Uh, Native Americans are 32 times as likely to experience homelessness compared to white, non-Hispanic individuals in the state of Minnesota. And if you take a look at people who are living outside, that number is even worse. Uh, what we've seen on the evictions front is that evictions have persisted above pre-pandemic levels. Uh, uh, I think we knew that they would start to increase uh, when the evictions moratorium off-ramp had been completed, uh, but we've really seen a persistent uh, number of filings above pre-pandemic levels. So I'd like to do at this point is to to show how um, what we do at Minnesota Housing, what we do together, uh, can, can impact that. So this is the agency's um, expenditures uh, in federal fiscal year 2021. We work on a state fiscal year, a federal fiscal year, and a calendar year, depending on what we're doing. But this is our, our federal fiscal year 2021 stuff. We're just wrapping up our fiscal, federal fiscal year 2022 numbers. You can see that the vast majority of what the agency does is in uh, single family uh, finance. Uh, first time home buyers, uh, we've got a step up program for people who are moving from their first to their second home um, and, and in that space. Uh, next biggest line item, rental production. Uh, I mentioned the HUD Rental Assistance Contract Administration is the third largest item. Um, the one time uh, federal emergency COVID relief dollars played a significant role in the agency's budget in 2021 and 22, um, and still in, in, in 23 and probably even 24. Um, we got a role to play in home improvement, and even though the, the green bar is starting to be invisible, uh, the housing stability work on homelessness, single family development, 
the home buyer education and counseling, and then a, a few other things like disaster recovery, uh, technical assistance, and things like that. Uh, the other way to take a look at it is if you take a look at our 2022-2023 affordable housing plan, which is what we anticipate that we'll be spending, you can take a look at uh, the sources and uses of funds uh, in terms of uh, how they spread out, in terms of where they come from and, and where they go out to. You'll see on the sources side, the mortgage capital from bond or agency resources is 67%. This is the 4% I pointed out before on the state appropriated part. Uh, the federal resources that we touch are about a quarter of our budget. So for the, uh, that, that two year period, 22, 23, a grand total of about $4 billion of activity. I know it has always been important to the agency and in our conversation with the legislature uh, that we understand that we have a statewide obligation as a state agency. If you take a look at the, at the competitive resources, those things that we do through requests for proposals and, and, and comp competitive awards, about 53% of the dollars that we've put out the door have gone in the metro area and 47% in greater Minnesota varies a bit from year to year, um, a lot of it having to do with the larger scale, higher dollar uh, multifamily projects and where those are happening. But I think that what it shows is that uh, it is a statewide issue. Uh, there are projects that compete for agency resources from across the state, and the agency takes great care to try to make sure that we are paying attention to investing uh, all across the state. Then I just wanted to do a, a slightly deeper dive uh, into the appropriated work. Um, and you'll hear me talk about the housing continuum a lot, especially with a surplus of this size. It seems like we contend to the full housing continuum. And when I say that, I mean everything from homelessness prevention to supportive housing, the, the intervention that's designed uh, to help people who have been homeless succeed uh, with housing stability the rental housing market and home ownership. So when I talk about the continuum, that's what I mean. Uh, this is one of our favorite slides. Um, uh, if you can see that little green stripe, that's how much of the state appropriations Minnesota housing represents. I, um, it would be my pleasure to uh, finish the session with just a little bit more green on that slide. Here's in mind both, Commissioner. Thank you, Chair Port. Um, uh, Mr. Mueller, uh, I think, walked through the, the, the numbers, uh, or Ms. Painter did, the base budget of $115.6 million spread out across uh, 15 straight state programs. Uh, we kind of think of them as being in, in five buckets, um, but they, they are specific line items. I, um, you know, if you take a look, the, the largest investments overall have been in that housing stability area. And then uh, that's some of it very specifically targeted to people experiencing homelessness or homelessness prevention. Some of it, like bridges, uh, targeted to adults with mental illness. Uh, some things targeted to, to school-aged kids and their families. About 50% of our appropriations uh, are housing stability. Uh, the average income of the households that we serve through those programs is about $10,000 a year. That always gives me pause. The average income of the households that we serve through those programs is about $10,000 a year. About 20% of appropriated programs are development programs uh, benefiting households uh, with the lowest incomes, predominantly households earning less than $25,000 a year. Um, our largest program, the Economic Development and Housing Challenge Program, affectionately known as Challenge, is um, <coughs> one of our highest demand programs. And I think one of its uh, greatest strengths is its flexibility. Communities tell us what they want to do, what they need in their community. And it really helps us uh, to create more homes. We can do single family and multifamily uh, apartment uh, buildings with that. We also have a, a program like the Greater Minnesota Workforce Development Program, you know, specifically focused on the needs uh, in Greater Minnesota. Um, I mentioned the, the counseling uh, programs that we have. Uh, so this is really a pretty broad range of things. 
I think that you know, something that really has become um, a greater and greater need and something that, that we, the agency, and in conversation uh, with the legislature, particularly last session, is really understanding that there's a whole world of, of lower cost rental housing that it doesn't have a federal subsidy. It doesn't have any um, uh, regulation around, uh, around rent and affordability. Uh, what they call naturally occurring affordable housing, or NOAA for short. Um, I think what we know is that when we can keep housing that's affordable to lower income renters in uh, that affordability zone, that's going to cost us a lot less than doing new construction from, from scratch. So really understanding our role in preservation, not just of preserving federally assisted housing, which has been kind of the main area of focus, but in looking at the role in uh, this, this market, uh, naturally occurring affordable housing has been, has been very important as well. It's great. <laughs> That's a, a, a perfect segue for me, Senator Rust. I, um, I just wanted to just highlight a few things. Family Homeless Prevention and Assistance Program, grants, this grants to counties, regions, nonprofits, other local organizations, really direct service program. It really is used for both homelessness prevention, but also uh, addressing homelessness, trying to, to minimize the length of time that any family or person would experience homelessness by getting people quickly back into housing and supporting them in that transition back. If you take a look at our fiscal year 21 spend, it was just under $10 million. We helped almost 5,000 households, um, almost 60% of the households that were helped identified as households of color. Also in the housing stability bucket is the housing trust fund. This is rental assistance for low income families uh, or operating subsidies directly to owners to keep a unit uh, priced so that the uh, renters only pay 30% of their income towards rent. You'll find in our conversations over the course of the session that, that when we talk about affordable housing, there's kind of two different ways in which you make a rental unit affordable. One is that you just kind of say the rent's going to be set at a certain level relative to where the area median income is. The other way is that you pin it to the income of an individual. And if an individual has assistance or the unit that they live in is assisted, you can say that depending on what your income is, you will only pay 30% of your income on rent. So uh, two different ways that we'll talk about affordability in the rental market. Take a look at the housing trust fund, just under $12 million in 21, helped over uh, 2,200 households, uh, about 63% of whom were households of color. The Bridges program. Um, Initially named Bridges uh, because when the uh, public housing, uh, ha Section 8 housing choice vouchers first started having waiting lists, the idea was that you could have a bridge uh, rental assistance until you were eligible for, uh, for public housing rental assistance. Um, that has become more and more scarce, so it's a longer and longer bridge, I guess I'd say. Uh, but it was really designed to support an individual or a family where at least one adult member had a serious mental illness. And again, uh, supports, um, supports people who are very low income, uh, just about 700 households with about 3.6 million spent in, in fiscal year 21. About a third of those households identify as households of color. Uh, it may come up at some point in time. Uh, I also chair the state's Olmstead sub-cabinet. That's the work uh, of states to help people with disabilities live, work, and play in the most integrated settings possible for them. Having a home that you can afford in the community is also fundamental to that work on Olmstead. Uh, the homework starts with home program, uh, about $2 million to help uh, about 250 households. Uh, this is really about uh, recognizing that kids can't do well in school if they're constantly moving. It's disruptive to being able to do your homework. It's disruptive to being able to start and end the school year in the same school. Um, it's, uh, it makes it difficult to, to form friends and just do the basic stuff of being a kid. I, um, this is a collaborative work uh, where we have uh, school districts and local nonprofits and local governments oftentimes coming together to identify kids in schools um, where the family would benefit from assistance. 
Commissioner, can I interrupt for a moment? On the last slide, you mentioned uh, the bridges program and the idea that it would sort of be originally this bridge until you would call it, or until there was available Section 8 housing. Um, I'm sure this is something we'll dig into more throughout the session, but can you talk a little bit about that this housing spectrum being a thing you can qualify for, but you don't get, uh, and, and what that actually looks like for Minnesotans? Uh, th thank you, Chair. I, uh, usually with federal assistance programs, if you're categorically an income qualified, you get the benefit. Um, if you're categorically an income qualified for medical assistance, you get medical assistance. Uh, if you need food, you get the, the food support. Um, I'm sure there are a whole bunch of other things that, that work that way, not with housing. Uh, you can be uh, categorically and income eligible for housing assistance, and the only people who categorically get it are homeowners who can take their mortgage interest deduction on their tax statement. If you're a renter and you need assistance, uh, HUD um, housing choice vouchers and public housing only help about one every four households that need that assistance. Um, uh, and what you have then is uh, oftentimes closed waiting lists for those programs that when they do open, uh, end up getting a deluge of applicants, uh, which means that the opportunity to actually move up on the waiting list can sometimes be um, years if, if ever. So the, um, that's why I said that the bridge has gotten longer. Um, we still view um, leveraging the federal uh, programs as optimal for state programs. And so, you know, there's still an opportunity with Bridges to be on a waiting list for a housing choice voucher. It's just that there hasn't been a, there, I would say there have been very modest increases to rental assistance through the public housing authorities over the course of the last decade. The only area where that's actually not been the case is for homeless veterans. Uh, where there's been a year-to-year -year increase in the number of vouchers that are available for homeless veterans, hence the uh, over 50% decrease in veterans experiencing homelessness across the country. General gist of what you were looking for, Chair? That's perfect. Thank you. And also to members, if you have questions along the way, don't feel like you have to wait till the end. We can address them through the presentation. So moving from the bucket of housing stability to uh, build more homes. Um, Again, the challenge program, that's the, the number one source of state appropriated dollars uh, to develop new housing. Um, oftentimes what we're doing here are zero interest deferred loans or grants to both for-profit um, and non-profit or local units of government uh, to, to do the work. It has flexibility by letting the community identify the type of housing that it needs. Uh, we don't go out there and say to communities, this year we're funding you know, X and anybody who wants to do housing that looks like this, you can come in. You come in and tell us what type of housing you need in your community and that you've arranged uh, the, the government, the, the neighborhood, the, the land, the developer to do it, and, and that's, that's what we look at when we fund. And it does not just new construction, uh, but it also uh, allows us to do uh, rehab in both the rental and the homeownership space. So uh, I love challenge. Um, challenge is a place where we can really support local communities and what they need to do. Um, it is still a competitive program, so people need to kind of come in. But the reason it's so competitive is because we uh, just don't have enough. So um, I love challenge. Um, I'm sure you all love challenge, and I hope this session loves challenge. I, um, workforce and affordable home ownership is really around uh, creating uh, more home ownership opportunities uh, throughout the state. This has been a very, um, a, a pretty small program um, uh, in terms of appropriations. It's a place where we have received uh, one-time money, but the base is just a half million dollars. Um, it is grants to cities, tribes, nonprofits, cooperatives, land trusts, all for housing development. It can be used for development costs, rehab, uh, land development. Uh, We'll make this deck available to you, uh, but partly we put it together so as we talk about line items, uh, you just kind of have it as a cheat sheet on each line item in terms of how big it is and what it does. Um, the Greater Minnesota Workforce Housing Program, uh, I had a great uh, trip across uh, northwestern Minnesota 
uh, in uh, the middle of the summer, it was just gorgeous, up in Roseau to do a grand opening of one of these, and then we went up to War Road and we put shovels in the dirt for a grand opening of one of these. The uh, Rosa one tied to Polaris, the War Road one tied to Marvin Windows. Um, these are the uh, rental homes that allow Polaris and Marvin and other corporations to make decisions to keep jobs in Minnesota instead of putting them in other states where they could, where they could opt to do that. And it tends to have an enormous amount of local government support, of the corporate support, oftentimes with dollars in the deal. Um, this program is what helps fill the gaps to make it possible to get the rental housing built in these communities. I love going to these, uh, these grand openings. Plus, you get to see parts of the state that uh, you maybe otherwise wouldn't just pass through. I, um, on the home ownership side, down payment and closing cost assistance. Um, uh, for many families, this is the difference between being a renter and a homeowner. And uh, the ability to use some state appropriated dollars in conjunction with some agency resources to do this um, has uh, really allowed us to, to continue to support first time home buyers. Uh, last year, we helped 5,000 people become homeowners. Uh, the legislature is making a small contribution to that with your appropriations, uh, especially with market conditions. This is an area we would love to talk more about uh, this session um, because it is an effective tool, but there are a lot of headwinds for folks who are trying to get into home ownership right now, so we think it's a good time for an extra assist. Talked about the other work on home ownership education, counseling, and training. I, um, it's a state network that's overseen uh, by our friends at the Minnesota Home Ownership Center, and um, really if you take a look at, uh, you know, helped set over 7,400 households uh, just uh, in fiscal year 21. So huge return on investment in terms of these home ownership education, counseling, and training uh, dollars. Uh, the re rehab loan program, 0% loans, uh, up to $37,500 uh, to make improvements in owner-occupied homes. Uh, do a lot of, of work to help uh, our elders stay in their homes, um, ramps, um, uh, roofs, uh, just health and safety uh, pieces, as well as energy efficiency improvements in order to help people to be able to afford the operating costs of their home. I, um, uh, we also have a rental rehab loan program uh, that this uh, really helps preserve and improve uh, rental housing in greater Minnesota. I, um, it's really designed for smaller private operators of federally assisted properties. So folks that have some HUD resources in or some USDA agriculture rural development housing dollars in. How do we help make sure that those are um, our assets that, that are high quality assets in communities? We do have uh, money that's targeted towards federal preservation as well. Uh, again, the, the HUD uh, project-based Section 8 portfolio as well as the USDA rural development portfolio. These are homes that were built in the 60s and the 70s uh, largely. Uh, but still really important assets in their community. Uh, many small towns across uh, the state will have, uh, you know, one property. You know, maybe it's, it's only 16, 24 units, but it's a critical part of the housing market in that community. And then uh, newer work for the agency, really, uh, during my tenure has been uh, translating uh, investments that the legislature has made in manufactured home park infrastructure. Uh, this is something we were able to get up off the ground um, and have now had a couple grant cycles on. Uh, in our most recent selections uh, that were done in December, we actually uh, have committed $9.5 million to improve 742 home lots. Um, manufactured home communities are probably some of the most affordable housing, and yet uh, they're not ones that have been as tended with public money. Uh, I've had an opportunity to tour uh, communities that have desperate need. Uh, they have water quality issues because their water isn't tied to, to the city water supply. They have sewer problems. Uh, they have roads so bad that the garbage trucks and the school buses won't drive in to pick up kids and trash, and so everybody has to go out to the edge of the community in order to do those types of things. So this has been really rewarding work. Um, for the agency to get more involved in, in manufactured home communities. And, and frankly, when I started traveling around the state, when I became commissioner, 
It's kind of something that you don't see unless you're looking. Um, but when you're driving on any highway in Minnesota, right before you get into a town, and right as you're leaving a town, you're more than likely to see manufactured home communities, but that also means that sometimes it's built right outside of the city limits. So figuring out how to leverage infrastructure into these communities has been really, really important, really rewarding work for the agency. We also have capacity building resources. Um, this is how we support uh, the regional uh, entities that move HUD homeless assistance grants. Uh, this is work we do with Homeline uh, for renter assistance. Uh, this is support we do to make the homeless management information system uh, that HUD requires of homeless providers and that we use as well. It's how we make uh, that data available. So um, that's what we have prepared. I always like to flash Dan's contact information up here. Um, uh, uh, Dan's easier to get hold of during session, and he will be up here for almost every hearing, regardless of whether you want to talk to me or not. Um, but I am, of course, available. And I know uh, that sometimes uh, Friday's an early session at your home. If there's something that, uh, that we can do together to help me understand the housing needs in your district, um, I have been out and about uh, and love getting out and about and love showing off uh, some of the things that we have done in district as well. Uh, so you can always call on me, but also just want to make sure that no matter what the question is, I like when you send the really hard ones to Dan, uh, but no matter what the question is, you can reach either one of us. So thank you, Chair. Thank you, Committee. And happy to take any and all questions that you have for me today. Thank you, Commissioner. Members, do you have questions for the Commissioner? Senator Rest. Um, in the recent years, I've been increasingly interested in um, um, programs that affect um, homelessness for youth. Uh, and that's not just high school students, as you know. It's junior high or it's middle school and, and, um, uh, and elementary school. And what, what kind of statistics do you have or programs that you can talk to us about, if not today, later, um, about uh, the statistics on homeless youth and um, is what Minnesota is doing um, making a difference? Commissioner? Uh, Chair Port and Senator Rest. I, um, I was talking to the chair before the hearing started. Um, you, either I or Kathy Denbrook, who is the executive director of the Minnesota Interagency Council on Homelessness and an assistant commissioner who sits mm -hmm. at my agency, or we could come together and talk about the broad work. Um, I think it's important to appreciate that we have had um, for some time a cabinet level interagency council on homelessness where we understand that many of our agencies play different roles in this work. So the Department of Education has federal uh, McKinney-Vento homeless dollars. They help make sure that homeless kids can at least get bused to their, their school of choice, um, regardless of where they are staying in shelter. You've got funding uh, through the uh, Runaway and Homeless Youth Act dollars sitting over mm -hmm. at the Department of Human Services. We have Homework Starts With Home we do the, the housing piece. And I think what I would say is that we have had a declining number of families experiencing homelessness in shelters. Um, in Minnesota, uh, we had a real decline uh, during the pandemic when there were additional resources available to help the families stay in their situation. But we have recently seen uh, the shelter census uh, climb back up um, and and that is that is disturbing. I, I think uh, for young people who are on their own it is very tied to the child welfare system and what happens to teenagers who are both uh, in uh, child welfare, but when they age out of that system, what type of resources are there? For homeless youth, there's huge disproportionality for uh, lesbian, gay, um, queer teenagers uh, who are having difficult with social support, fitting in, so you have huge disproportionality of that in youth experiencing homelessness. I mean, we have, uh, relative to our total size, probably one of the strongest networks of youth supportive housing in Minnesota compared to other communities around the country. So there are great examples of both developers and service providers that are offering 
um, yeah, I kind of think of it as the equivalent of what dorm life was for, like for me as a college student, but for young people who aren't in college, the opportunity to live independently, but in settings that are geared towards their age group, um, and really providing support for these young people as they navigate finishing school, jobs, uh, reconnecting with family, um, you know, thinking about uh, thinking about what they want to do when they grow up. And so I think that there's, uh, there's a lot of understanding of, of what we need to do, particularly around youth. I would separate the conversation about young kids who are with their families uh, versus uh, young people who are on their own. But I think there's, there's, there's a fair amount of it. On, on family homelessness, if we can get the rental market right, um, you know, I think that that's a big piece of it. And I think we saw evidence of that. Um, when we had extra assistance out there during the pandemic. But we'd be happy to talk more, or uh, Kathy Tenbrook, uh, I know, would love an invitation to come in and talk about the work more broadly. Thank you. Follow-up? Follow up? Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Commissioner, one of the um, federal programs that had um, a, a very beneficial effect on families in poverty who are often associated with being homeless um, was the um, the child uh, care or the child not the child care credit that's important too, but the child tax credit. And I know that the um, the governor and certainly those of us on the Senate Tax Committee are interested in um, examining at least how how or if we should continue to be uh, promoting. Um, that kind of, uh, of benefit um, because it seems to have brought kids and their families out of poverty and that association with uh, stable housing and getting away from insecurity in housing, that that's had, uh, uh, I, and I think to a lot of people, a very surprising um, impact on uh, lowering the poverty rate. I wonder if you have any comment on that. Commissioner? Chair Port, Senator Rest, um, I will leave it to the uh, new Commissioner of Revenue to speak specifically to the, the, the tax policy piece of it. But what I can say is that when we take a look, when we took a look at what happened with evictions and what, what happened with family shelter census during the period of uh, the pandemic and the various financial tools that were available from different mm -hmm. sources. When the federal child tax credit ended, we do believe that that had an impact on um, families um, uh, with evictions being filed. Th these were things, there were a lot of things happening at once, so you know I'm not able to parse it out, but certainly not just here in Minnesota, but in the conversation that I'm in, involved it with my national uh, cohort, you know, I think we all saw that as something that had been beneficial to help families be able to pay the rent. Senator Draheim. Thank you, uh, Chair Port. Uh, good uh, first hearing. Thank you. Um, and, and thank you, Commissioner. Um, you know, I, I think Senator Rest brings up uh, a, a great topic that I think there's a huge learning curve for for us at the table here. And I think it would be very helpful if we had a list of all those programs and, and maybe just started a spreadsheet that we could work off of for the year on what the programs are and what they're attempting to do. So when we try to figure out what we can do to do things better here in Minnesota, we kind of can refer to those different programs, both state and federal, because um, the federal, they always have strings attached. Um, but I, I don't know if that's possible or not, but that would be a recommendation. Yeah. Thank you. I, thank you, uh, Senator Draheim. We will work on pulling that together uh, with the agency and also um, fiscal and, and legal staff here as well. And, and to your point, Senator Rest, uh, on Thursday we will have um, advocates from some of the organizations that serve homeless youth who will be here to talk more broadly about what they're seeing across the state as well. Chair Port, if I may. Absolutely. I mean, one of the, I think, I don't know if I want to say transformational, but inside of government, I think it is, is that we have changed the way that we build the state budget inside of state government when it comes to these uh, cross-cutting issues. So you will see um, uh, when the governor's budget comes out, 
that when we're talking about uh, housing stability, we're not just talking about Minnesota housing, but we're actually talking about the work of eight different state agencies. We've done that cross-cut work for you. When we're talking about uh, the climate, we're not just talking about what's happening at MPCA or talk about what's happening at Commerce. We're talking about what's happening across agencies that are doing things like that. It used to be that you weren't allowed to talk to each other until final decisions have been made uh, by the governor's office, but it turns out that when you talk to each other before the decision is made, you have the opportunity to make better decisions. That's something I'm really excited about because it was something that we actually rattled the cages on when I was working in DC. We could never share it publicly, but we actually had a cross-cutting federal agency budget on homelessness, and we actually learned how to talk to each other before everything was baked and I think it improved what it was that we were able to ask for. So I know Kathy would love to come in and share that. Thank you, Commissioner. We will definitely uh, be inviting Ms. Tenbrook uh, to address our committee. And also, uh, I'm in conversations with the chairs of um, the Human Services Committee and HHS to potentially hold joint committees on uh, sort of the spectrum of homelessness uh, that that spreads throughout all of our committees because it is they're they're so interconnected at some points that uh, there there are conversations that we should be having together um, so that could be helpful to us as well. Other questions, members? Senator Rest. No, Madam Chair, please include the tax committee, um, and because we um, I don't we had an an aid program for cities and counties. Um, that it's funded through the, um, a tax provision, um, like like of local government aid or other things, you know. And um, uh, I think we can be a, a, a good partner in in that. Maybe we don't have the wide expansion of the programs, but we certainly have a targeted um, audience and helping um, and making that happen through um, a program aid that is that is can be part of the tax committee's target, not just health and human services. Thank you, Senator Rest. I will take you up on that. Other questions? Thank you, Commissioner, and thank you, Mr. Kitzberger. Uh, we appreciate your time today, and we will see you back here soon. Um, members, to let you know, uh, this Friday, uh, the Capital Investment uh, Committee has asked us to join them for a joint uh, committee hearing and tour at the Higher Ground Shelter in St. Paul. You will be receiving in specific information on parking and all of that uh, in your emails, but it starts at 10 a.m. And following the tour, we, will, we are invited to gather for a roundtable discussion with community partners to discuss housing infrastructure and homelessness solutions. The meeting should be done by 1145. We hope as many of you as possible are able to join us. And if you can let uh, Davin know so that we can get a head count uh, and room for that. That would be fantastic. Um, please let us know if you have any questions on that as well. Uh, and at that point, the Senator Lucero. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, just one quick question or request of you or your staff. So I appreciate the, the budget jurisdiction uh, of this committee. Uh, because I am new to uh, this committee and because uh, it's my understanding that these jurisdictions are spread across multiple statutes. Uh, my request is, could we get a list of the, the chapter of statutes that are in the jurisdiction of this committee? Ms. Painter? Thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Lucero. You can see um, on the right-hand side of the, the table that chapter 462A is specifically noted. It's the whole chapter, so. That should be the only one. Okay, so, so that I'm seeing for the housing finance agency, but is there other topics, like down here under other issues, when it comes to any of the topics that might be covered in other statutes? Yeah, there'll be topics that are spread throughout the statute, so there's not specific chapters that are our responsibility. It's the, it's the topic itself that's our, within our jurisdiction. Okay, thank you. Senator Lucero, I'll just add to that. This is uh, sort of brand new territory for this committee, and we will all be learning together. But as we figure out those areas, uh, we'll be sure to send them out to all of you. Members, uh, at that point, I think we have addressed everything on our agenda, and being no other business, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you.